Hello everyone. Today we start our section on paleoclimates. In earlier lectures, we looked at measurements of temperature and carbon dioxide. Measurements typically, typically go back decades to a century, which isn't really far enough back in time to assess whether we are within the natural variability of the Earth's system. Records from the past of climate change provide important insights into the present and future climate. Today we will explore the methods that paleoclimatologists use to determine past climates and their impacts. The importance of paleoclimate data has increased remarkably in the last two to three decades, as is evident in its increasing representation in subsequent IPCC assessment reports. In climate change science, archives refer to the source or storage of data. Modern measurements are an archive of climate data, which as we have seen are limited in time and space. Paleoclimate archives include historical documents, oral traditions, tree rings, ice cores, marine and lake sediments, corals, and speleothems. The temporal resolution, that is the frequency of observations, and the time period covered for each archive varies, as is shown here. A proxy is a fossil or geochemical or biogeochemical signal that represents a particular climate variable. Archives often include multiple proxies. In the thin ice video, several proxies were used from the ice cores to determine different climate variables. Let's begin a review of paleoclimate archives and their proxies. Historical records are human documents that can be used to infer climate variables. For example, the painting below shows ice on the Thames River in London, England in 1677. Today, the Thames River does not freeze. This painting and many others show that Northern Europe was generally colder than today between 1300 and 1850. This period is referred to as the Little Ice Age. The sagas written by the Norse provided clues that the Vikings had traveled to North America about 1000 AD, centuries before Christopher Columbus. The image on the right is Lance O'Meadows in Newfoundland, which is confirmed to be a Norse dwelling. How were the Vikings able to travel the cold and inhospitable North Atlantic? Evidence from other sources indicates that the North Atlantic was warmer between 950 and 2050 AD. This period is usually referred to as the medieval climate anomaly. Paintings and written documents can help us determine past climates. Another example comes from my colleague, Carrie Mock, who has painstakingly reviewed hundreds, if not thousands, of ship records, journals, and diaries to track past hurricanes. Here you can see a track of an 1867 hurricane that Carrie was able to determine using diaries, newspapers, and ship journals. His research is helping us to better understand how hurricane tracks and intensity might change in response to warming temperatures. Historical documents always almost always have some sort of date associated with them. But when we look at and consider other archives, how do we know the age of, the, of these paleo records? We have two main approaches, incremental and radiometric dating. Very basically, incremental dating involves counting layers, whereas radiometric dating is based on the radioactive decay of unstable isotopes to stable nucleides. If we know the decay constant, that is the rate the radioactive isotope decays, we can determine the age. Incremental dating can be used to date tree rings, ice cores, and lake sediments. I'm sure you have all counted the rings of trees to determine their age. In the spring, trees grow rapidly. As a result, cells are large and the wood is less dense and looks lighter. This is called early wood. In late summer and autumn, trees grow much slower and the wood is more dense and appears darker. This is called late wood. These light and dark couplets represent one year. The oldest known tree was referred to as Prometheus. It was a bristlecone pine 
that grew in Great Basin National Park in Nevada. In the 1960s, a student had just started to study these pines. He was trying to take tree cores, but his tool kept getting stuck. He asked the park for permission to cut one tree down, which the park granted. He cut the tree down, and that night, in his hotel, he began counting the rings. To his horror, he counted more than 4,800 rings. I became friends with Don Curry when he was in his 70s, and it was one of his greatest regrets that he had cut down the oldest known tree. The image here shows the cross-section of the tree which is now in the University of Arizona, Tree Ring Lab. Of course, most trees do not live as long as Prometheus. So to extend the dating range, dendrochronologists use a technique called cross-dating. This image illustrates cross-dating. Uh, when we do cross-dating, what we're doing is matching patterns in the, tree, in the tree rings of living trees to those in dead trees or artifacts. This allows us to extend tree ring chrono chronologies farther back in time. In the image, the first the black arrow on the right links up a specific tree pattern in a living tree and a dead tree. In the red arrow, we see another pattern that is matched up between the living tree, the dead tree, and an artifact. As I said, this allows us to extend tree ring chronologies much farther back in time. A.E. Douglas developed the cross-dating technique to determine the age of Chaco Canyon and Meze Verde, famous Anasazi sites in New Mexico that we will learn about next week. He also recognized that variations in the widths of the rings could provide important information about moisture availability and drought in the U.S. Southwest. Seasonal layers also occur in ice cores. The upper image shows an ice core where layers are clearly visible. The lower image shows light and dark layers revealed in an ice core. The lighter layers occur in summer, like and the darker layers in winter. Here, 12 years are represented. In lake sediments, variations in sediment color, grain size, or composition indicate seasonal shifts. In this core, the lighter layers are deposited in summer and the dark in winter. Each dark light couple, couplet is referred to as a varb and represents one year of time. The second type of dating, radiometric dating, is dependent on radioactive isotopes. Isotopes are atoms with different atomic masses, that is neutrons plus protons, but the same atomic number, that is the number of protons. Unstable isotopes or radioactive nucleides go through radioactive decay to become stable isotopes. Radioactive decay is a random process that results in the loss of energy from the breakup of the nucleus. The unstable isotope is referred to as the parent nuclei, and the stable nuclei that results from the radioactive decay of the parent is called the daughter. This plot shows elements arranged based on number of neutrons on the x-axis and number of protons on the y-axis. Isotopes are shown on the horizontal lines. The black squares show stable isotopes, the white radioactive isotopes. Let's look at carbon-14. Carbon-14 is an unstable isotope. It is formed in the Earth's upper atmosphere when cosmic rays hit nitrogen-14. Carbon-14 is the parent nuclei and decays to nitrogen-14. Note, both these nucleides have atomic masses of 14, but different atomic numbers. Carbon-14 has an atomic number of 6, and nitrogen-14 an atomic number of 7. These are not isotopes. Carbon has three main isotopes, carbon-14, carbon-13, and carbon-12. Carbon-13 and carbon-12 are stable, and carbon-12 makes up most of the carbon on the Earth. Carbon-14 is radioactive. Note, 
All three of these atoms have atomic numbers of six, but different atomic masses. These are isotopes. Radioactive decay of any given atom is random, but occurs at a predictable and constant rate. In this plot, parent nucleides are shown in red and daughters in blue. The rate that parents decay to daughters for any given pair of nucleides is a constant. The time it takes for half the parent to decay to daughter is referred to as the half-life. In the first panel, there is only parent. After one half-life, half the parent nucleides have decayed to daughter nucleides. After two half-lives, three-quarters of the parent nucleides have decayed to daughter nucleides, and so on. Let's look at an example. This plot shows the take decay of cobalt-60, a short-lived isotope. After 5.27 years, only half the parent is left. Therefore, the half-life is 5.27 years. Here we see how the number of parent nucleides, shown in red, decreases exponentially, whereas the number of daughter nucleides, shown in blue, increases exponentially. The point that the two plots intersect is the half-life. This slide summarizes what we've talked about so far. At the beginning, we have no, um, we have all parent and no daughter. After one half-life, we have half of the parent and um, an equal amount of daughter. After two half-lives, we only have a quarter of the parent left. After three half-lives, we only have an eighth of the parent left, and so on.